I ended up getting a note from Donna. She's not going to be here tonight because she's on the road. She's traveling. And uh, I didn't hear anything from Martin, but sometimes he shows up a little bit late. So, okay. Well, last week we were, we were looking at Abram and the fact that Abram really still cared about his nephew Lot. And when the two sets of kings uh, groups came together and fought, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah lost uh, uh, and the others that were with them, they lost. And they all got taken into captivity by the Northern kings. And uh, guess what? Lot and his family and his possessions were with them. So when Abram got word, what happened? Where's my nephew? He said, he got together his over 300 men from his, you know, his servants, his family. Uh, I guess that's, they would kind of term them his family, even though they were servants and why not? Because remember, Abram had had no children up to this point. And uh, so he went out and he rescued. Uh, he actually, I mean, you can see that God's hand was in it because, I mean, he conquered these five kings and their forces and got Lot and all his possessions. As a matter of fact, he got all of their the possessions back. And he took them all down with him. And uh, if you remember, that was where we came out to the place where the king of Salem showed up, which was a, uh, after the order of Melchizedek. Remember, we talked about that. And we see that uh, he, uh, Abram gave him 10%. I mean, so obviously this king of Salem was somebody representing a godly individual. And so we'll, we saw about that. And actually, uh, Melchizedek is spoken of quite a bit in Hebrews. If you look at chapters four, five, and six, it talks about it. He's even mentioned, you know, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek is also mentioned in the Psalms too. So, I mean, this was no small actual representation by this king that came and, uh, you know, interacted with Abram at that point. But now we're going to get into probably the most pivotal part that follows God's calling of Abram to come down to Canaan. Remember when he called him, he gave him some promises. Well, now he's going to put these promises into effect. And it, in doing that, it's called a covenant. A covenant is like a contract. Um, between parties okay and uh, just remember for all the covenants in the bible whether it was the adamic covenant the agreement god made with a adam uh whether it was the noahic covenant the agreement god made with noah the abrahamic covenant the one that we will study tonight the davidic covenant the one he made with king david all covenants that god makes he will carry out so you can look at them in two ways. If they've already been fully fulfilled, then God's done his part. But there are some, uh, some of the covenants that haven't been fulfilled all the way. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came, the good news is the new covenant. Okay, it's the new covenant. It's God's plan for all mankind. John 3.16 kind of covers what the central issue is on the new covenant. Well, a covenant is serious. It's not something to be taken lightly. Now, man has problems with covenants. Okay, we may do contracts and we break contracts. We break covenants. We, we try to get lawyers to get out of some contract we've done. But with God, he never breaks a covenant. No matter what, he won't break a covenant, even if we break the covenant with him. He won't break his part of the covenant at all. So we'll look at what that covenant is between God and Abram. As a matter of fact, part of the covenant is he gets renamed to Abraham, right? Father of many nations instead of, you know, his very limited name of Abram. So, so we'll look at that. And uh, if we keep going, we'll get into a place where we find how man tries to fix a covenant, right? In other words, Sarah gave her maidservant to Abram to have a child because she couldn't have a child. She wasn't patient waiting for God's time. 
And so we end up having uh, another nation that comes about because of this action, but that wasn't God's plan. So let's look at the covenant because the covenant is what makes sense as to what Sarai does uh, to be able to try to help God to meet his requirement. Remember, God doesn't need any help, right? I mean, if he's the one that says, I'm going to do it, he will do it. Okay, he'll do it in his way and in his time. But I think that that's the issue with humans is we... In spite, in spite of us, well, he'll do Well, there's it. that too. But a lot of times we get very impatient, don't we? We It's like, man, how come it hasn't happened already? You know, aren't you God? For heaven's sakes, can't you do it like now? Why do we have to wait? Well, that's how man gets. You know, we always tend to think, hey, and, and a lot of time if God's not doing it, well, he needs help. Here I am. I'm going to help you and we'll get it done. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. I'm so, there. yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so that's where we're going tonight. Any questions, comments? By the way, hello, Lynn. Welcome tonight. Hello. Thank you. So that's where we're going tonight with our study. Any questions, comments? What anything? What was this covenant with a Adam? The covenant with Adam, remember, uh, the big one was to be fruitful and multiply. Oh, I thought he said that to Noah's son. Oh, he did to them too. That was part of the Noahic covenant oh. that carried on down. Okay. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, basically, God had and the other part of the covenant was that he was going to um he is going to be responsible basically for all of god's creation right on, the, on earth he was to look after the, everything that god had created like the animals and whatnot and so yeah i mean those were part of that covenant that he had with adam all the way back then so we're supposed to be looking after the animals and nature <sighs> Yes. I mean, we, actually, technically, we still have that obligation because God put it all under our, under hu the human creature's control. And so, yes, we are supposed to be looking out for nature. Okay. It, but there was a bit of a change that happened. You got to remember, in the Adam time, animals were not afraid of, of humans and humans and animals interacted. But remember, after the flood, remember that we studied that it said that animals were going to fear man from then on, and that also that's when animals at the same time uh, were changing their diets. You know, some of them would still continue to eat, you know, uh, shrubs, grass, like, like cows and horses, but in the past and before the flood, all animals ate nothing but, you know, tree or uh, ground produced fruit. They didn't, they were not carnivores at all. And it wasn't till after the flood that some of the animals became carnivores. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there was a change. There was definitely a change. And all of that, you got to, you know, I mean, the whole thing about change is that the change came about because of sin. You know, it wasn't because, you know, God just said, OK, hey, I, I my first shot at animals wasn't quite what it should have been. So I'm going to change them. No, it yeah. was it all foundationally came to the whole issue of sin, the good and evil issue. And, so and we're supposed to look after nature now. So yes, we are. He does. And we don't we don't do a very good job of it, do we? Well, some of them eat us now. <laughs> yeah, ex there you go. And I mean, in nature, I think the problem is we tend to want to use it to our advantage uh, in the sense of what can it give me? And, and we have to understand, I mean, Jesus said, hey, uh, God looks after the sparrow. Can't I look after you? See, and I think that that's one of the issues is that we get too dependent on thinking we've got to do everything and we want the world to produce what we want, which is found at the core of it is money you know and so we abuse god's creation to try to get the most out of it 
that will benefit the individual, the corporation, that kind of thing. When, I mean, if we use God's creation the way God intended, it would produce for us all we ever needed for all humankind. But, you know, that's not the human way of looking at it. From a creature's way of looking at it, it's always about what can I get out of creation. And so we don't take care of creation very well, do we? Unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't. Unfortunately not. And, and sadly, we're supposed to be taking care of it, though. But, yeah. But that? Yeah. I think it's too late for us to... Uh... <laughs> To go back to those days because no matter what yeah it's no. like it's like here in america okay we we, we didn't with the global warming and so on but you have all the countries that don't care that's so right. if we take care of, of the environment but you got the rest of the population they don't, they don't give a hope so why why are we paying the price i mean it's not that we shouldn't care but not not go to the extreme in this case you see eleven thousand people lost their job just yep. because supposedly to protect the environment well that's the yeah. so or well, at, at least, least they, it ain't gonna happen yeah <laughs> no no and, okay. and that's just that. a lot of times what you see is that people blame it on the environment but when you look at it there are always deeper underlying issues than what the press brings out sometimes in terms of or what other organizations blame it on so the so reality is hey, contract. what's we're, that we're in breach of contract in essence, that's basically what it comes down to. We don't live up to what God intended us to be doing and looking out for his creation. That's that's but, the reality. But we also know that because of sin, that's what it the all is. earth is cursed. That's it. Okay. It's like the Bible said, the, the, yep. the, the, the earth, where is it? Uh, what's the word again? <laughs> uh, it's, what's the way it's used? It's anxious to be redeemed. Yep. Right? That's With it. With the curse. So... You know, I mean, we could try. I mean, of course, we are still responsible, but at the end, not going to happen end. until this earth will be redeemed by. Uh, that's right, redeemed by God. That's yep. that's the only time it's going to happen. So those people that try, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. No, it's not. And at the end, Second Peter three tells us that hey, the only way God can finally resolve it is to totally destroy the cursed creation and remake it. Second Peter three, right? And so that's when we'll have the new heaven and the new earth. Sin will be gone. And then we will live on the new new earth. The new heaven and the yeah. new heaven will come down onto the earth. And that's where we'll live forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, with God. Then we'll be back to where it should be. That's where God and had we'll intended be, it we'll to be. We'll be glorified. Amen. We Amen. have no, no desire for sin. Exactly. Then we won't worry about, hey, did you drill out the last petroleum part so that we can you know, keep our car yeah, going? It, there won't be no need for petroleum. <laughs> exactly. It won't be any need. We won't need cars. Exactly. <laughs> hey. A do-over. Yeah, that's going to be, be that's that, gonna be that's beautiful. That's the word. Makeover. Amen. Amen. The, only ones, the only one that could do is God. Not yep. man. So let's look, just like those were covenants that God had made with man. The Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant. Now we're going to get into the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what we're going to look at today. And just remember, and uh, just keep in mind that a covenant is a contract, an agreement between parties. And that's exactly what it is. It's an agreement between God and Abraham. Now, just remember this also. Even if man fails in the covenant, if God made the agreement, he will not fail in the covenant. He'll still carry his part out. It's man can fail, but God won't fail in the agreement. So anything that you see in any covenant in the Bible that comes up, if it's not been carried out yet, it will be fulfilled in God's time. Because that's just who God is. God doesn't break a covenant. You know, he says, Man can be, you know, not be faithful, but God will always be faithful in carrying it out. So any, any final questions before we pray and we'll jump in. I would just say about the covenant that, okay, God remains faithful, but when man uh, break the covenant, there's a price, there's a, pr a price oh, to yeah. pay, which they have paid. Now, Israel has paid the price, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
Absolutely. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together and study your word. I pray that you would give us insight and understanding and let us see your wonder and how your plan was put into place so that we could benefit from it today through your son, Jesus Christ. So Lord, just open our hearts and minds and let us let us enjoy the, the word that you've given to us and, and see your wonder in and through what you did all the way back with Abraham so many thousands of years ago. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay, let's go ahead and share out the screen here and take a look at what we're looking at in uh, Genesis chapter 15. And now he says, after these things, chapter 15, verse one, after these things, and now he's talking about when he's saying these things, he's talking about all the things that have lev led up to this point. And the last thing we saw in 14 was where he went and rescued Lot, who had been, you know, taken captive along with all his goods, plus all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, too. And a Abraham or Abram went and rescued them. That was one of the things, but it's everything up to this point, all the way from him leaving, uh, well, not from Ur the Chaldees, but when he went up north, and that's where God called him, and he went to Cana, Canaan, and then, because there was that, that um, uh, what's the word? Come on, Ted, stop losing it. Uh, that famine that was going on, he, they ended up going down to Egypt for a while, and then they came back. Well, he's talking about all these things all of that has led up to that those are the things he's talking about and he and basically what it's shown too is that god's been faithful all along he's taking care of abram he's taking care of the situation even when he was down in egypt that thing got resolved as a matter of fact he walked away with a lot of goods even though he basically had lied uh, about sarah being his you know sister which it was a white lie. He is his, she was his half sister, but he was using it as if they were not married. So that's why basically Sarah got Sarah high got taken into the harem that that Pharaoh's harem. So, but God protected them anyway, protected both of them, and he walked away with a lot of goods because of that. So we see that God took care of him, and so all of these are the things he's talking about. After these things, now look. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So God obviously has said, okay, he's, he's developed enough. And we see that when God calls somebody, he develops a person over time. Look at Joseph. How many years was he going through difficult times? And we'll study him. You know, he was looking at, you know, many, many years of Potiphar, the jail and whatnot before he was actually called in to actually do what God had called him to do. And so, well, technically he was doing it all along, but God was developing through all that. Well, that's exactly the same thing that's happened here with Abram. God's developing him. And, and the, he, that's the same he does with us. When he calls us, he develops us. He develops us. And in the process, then he equips us to be able to carry out what he wants us to do. Well, that's the same thing. So now, at this point, in Abram's relationship with God, God comes to him in a vision. Now, look what he says. Fear not, Abram. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think this is something that could be traumatic. So he's telling, hey, man, it's almost like peace be with you, right? Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. Now, a shield is an item of protection, right? Right. In other words, he's saying, hey, look, I've taken care of you already. I, I was with you when you went and rescued your nephew Lot. Look, at those were five kings and their forces that you were able to overtake and get Lot and all his goods and all the stuff back from them. I've been with you, right? He's saying, I am your shield. I'm your protection. I'm with you. And because I'm with you, look, hey, everything belongs to God, right? So he says, your reward shall be great because I'm the one that's with you. I'm the one taking care of you. And I'll tell you, 
that's what we need to do too, is we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and trust him, not as a health, wealth, and prosperity thing, but as a thing that says, God, you're in control. I'm yours and you're looking out for your own. You know, we're children, we're his children and the father loves his children. And so we look at him that way, not, not as a, you know, sugar daddy kind of guy that we just say, hey, I want this and poof, we get it. But as, as somebody that loves us so much and, and he, he'll care about us that when we obey him and we're following him, everything will work out according to his perfect plan. If we try to do it on our own, we're gonna, God says the, uh, the father disciplines those he loves. So he, he, you know, fixes things so that we will become more capable and able to do what he wants us to do. Well, in this case, uh, Abram's at this point. And so we see that because God is pleased with how he's been developing and their relationship is developing, he's, I mean, God's telling them straight up, hey, look, you're, I'm going to protect you. And guess what? You'll also have a great reward from this. And hey, having God on your side is about as much reward as you could ever ask for. Okay. So verse two says, now, but Abraham said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Now, remember I said I really like Abram because Abram never talked back to God. He just, you know, accepted pretty much anything that God put. And he said, yeah, if that's what you want, basically, I'm going to do it, right? Well, this is one of those exceptions, but it's, it's a good question. Because in that culture, hey, your own progeny was who you needed to carry on your family, your family name and whatnot. And so what Abram is saying is if I'm childless, I've got to use a second party who is not of my family to actually carry on my name. Now, I'll do that, but he's not blood of my blood or flesh of my flesh. And that's what he's telling God here. He's saying, hey, look, you know, I mean, if you're going to bless me, if my reward's going to be great, shouldn't I have my own children? You know, that's what he's kind of implying in the process. And so he's saying that the next in his family or in his house, notice he says, heir of my house. He doesn't say family. He says heir of my house because this this Eliezer of Damascus is probably the one that he has become closest to. And so he's made him the top dog, so to speak, and he would be the heir, but he is not blood of Abram. And so in verse three, he says, and Abram, uh, he says, and Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir, not my family, member of the household, right? And so in verse four, but look what he says in verse four, and behold, look what God tells him, behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Now that's cut and dried, isn't it? Right. It's like you think he's all that there is, but in God's economy, he's not the one. So, you know, get your mind off of that. Eliezer is not your heir. And so he's saying, your very own son shall be your heir. Now that's straight up, right? Your very own son shall be your heir. Now, he is only married to one woman. He's only married to Sarai. Now, what's Sarai's condition in being able to bear children? Her age? Well, she's barren. She can't have any. Yeah, and her womb never be. allowed her to get pregnant. Right. Because even as a youngster, she couldn't get pregnant. Right. So she's been barren all this time. And so I think, I think Abram realizes that, but he doesn't want to say, yeah, but God, you know, but God has made it clear that he will have his very own son. Now, this is covenantal. OK, he's saying you're going to have your very own son, your very own heir. Now, the implied issue here is that it's going to be with your wife, not somebody else, but with your wife, not a concubine, but your wife. 
But see, now this is where faith comes in, right? Because at this point, you have to accept what God is saying, or you don't. Because if you start worrying about but and start playing the what if game, yeah, but what if God, Sarah can't have children, so where am I supposed to have children from? You know, and that kind of thing. You start getting into this this really mushy ground, the slippery slope where you don't want to end up when you're talking to God, right? So, but he, God, I mean, made it clear, your very own son shall be your heir. And, and then look, I mean, obviously in his vision, uh, God brings him out. He says, he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. Oh, man, I, th I think that was a big homework assignment. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm glad he said he put that prepositional phrase in there, if you are able to number them, right? And he says, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now, at this point, some people would say, wait a minute, there's no way Abram could have had that many. I don't care how big of a harem he had. There is no way he could pop out that many kids, right? So you got to understand that God is looking at the big picture and he's telling them what he is going to be the pivotal starting point for. Okay, it's going to start through him because God is working with him. And this is the covenant that these people are going to come from him. Okay, so he says, so shall your offspring be. Now, look at look at here. Abram didn't go any further. He didn't ask any more questions. He asked the right question. God gave him the answer, right? And look at verse six. And he believed the Lord. And look what it says. And it that faith, remember, belief and faith are the same thing. You believe you have faith, regardless of what your senses are telling you. You're saying, I'm going to believe God because he said it. Regardless of what my intellect or my emotions are telling me, Abram had a strong faith. So we see that Abram believed the Lord and he counted it. He, God, counted it to him as righteousness. As a matter of fact, this is used in different places by different writers in the New Testament that bring that up. Hebrews 11 is one of them where, you know, you get the wall of faith, you know, of those people in faith. And you, you have other places, too, that it speaks to this issue of, of that. Romans 4.18, notice there it was cited in Romans 4.18, Hebrews 11.12. Uh, so it's brought up in those areas because this was a significant issue. That's why faith is so important in our walk with the Lord. Because Hebrews 11.6 also says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So faith is essential in our walk with the Lord. And as a matter of fact, we know it in the Reformation is by faith alone, solo fidelis, right? I mean, by faith alone, that's what we're looking at here. And, and Abram had this in spades. I mean, he trusted God. Most people would be asking a lot of questions. Not Abram. Abram was solid in his faith with the Lord. And because of that, God counted it to him as righteousness. And we see this, this is a little different in the Old Testament than the New Testament, because we look at what Jesus did. But what what do we require in what Jesus did? We also require faith in what Jesus did, don't we? As a matter of fact, remember that the, one of the disciples asked Jesus, you know, um, the, you know, an issue about uh, the matter of, you know, being with him. And Jesus told him it's more blessed are those that haven't seen and believed. You know, yeah. because here these disciples have been with Jesus. They had been with the son of God and seen all this. But the issue was, is when Jesus was going to go to the cross and ascend to the father. Now it was based on faith that we were going to come into relationship with Jesus Christ. Saving faith to start our relationship and then faith throughout as we trust him in carrying out what he promises he will do in his word. And so. Okay. So we see yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, did you have something, Mark? Yes, going back to, I think I, I made a comment on this verse before we okay. discussed this, but going back to where it says, 
that so you so shall your offspring be compared to the stars. Right. And, and we said that. Uh, remember that this this is not physically. In other words, That's we right. know the nation of Abraham of uh, the nation of uh, of uh, Israel, or even though wherever they are, right. They, the the population is not that not that big. Okay, so we uh, can't okay. take this right. literature. Right. So it's, it, this verse is you know it, 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 you got to take it in the spiritual sense because we are sons of Abraham by faith. Yeah. Amen. And that's basically what God was referring to. Now that his nation cannot be counted, his descendant cannot be counted because right. the nation of Israel is not that big. So yep. this is this verse here it refers to that by faith, the spiritual we, offspring. Yeah, yeah. We as as a son of uh, of Abraham. So that that promise basically applies to us. Then. Yep. That's why absolutely you, as a as a Christian, you know, basically, you know, it, it's it's can it, it was going to be a large nation that's what we yep. are today so. and that's how the covenant works see our relationship in the family of god goes all the way back to this abrahamic covenant that's where we sit we sit in this abrahamic covenant because of god's promise right yeah. here to abram exactly and every every time a person accepts christ well the, the the nation is expanding right that's because right. It's by, it, it becomes a child of abraham by faith yeah, because that's when, when Jesus uses the example of the branches grafted in, you're grafted in to the family of Abraham because mm -hmm. of this covenant. Yeah. Through Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah, because someone will take this verse and say, they're skeptic, say, oh, that, that's not true. We, we know the population of, of Israel, or we know that, that it could be counter. You know, there was, <laughs> was twistings around because they take our context. Yeah. Yep. It's like I was talking Amen. to someone today, and he was saying, "Oh, the the Muslims say we worship three God." I said, right. "You know what? Why they say it? because it's ignorance. They they got they got to get to to the root. That's right. The root of the of the uh, the theology instead That's of right. assuming things. Exactly. Amen. Amen. We'll put we'll put brother Martin. So we see that this promise is there, and it's affecting us today. Okay, we're we're tied into it. Praise God for that. Right." Okay, so in verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Ur of the Chaldeans is down around the northern part of the Persian Gulf, or what is now called the Gulf of Arabia. It's all the way down in the southern Mesopotamian Valley. That's where uh, Abram's family, his father, was brought up from, okay, because the, the actual calling came up from that time, from Abram's father, and they went up north, okay? And he says, I brought you out from there. In other words, I moved you out from that area and to give you this land to possess. And this is now all the way over here in Canaan. And he says, uh, but he said, oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Now, that's a question that I kind of thought was a little off, especially after he was already accepting what God had already said. But okay, apparently he needed a little bit more help here on this one. So he says, how do I know it? How can I be sure that this is going to happen? And so now God, this is where God does uh, the thing that was going on at that time in, in the way that they carried out a covenant between people. Okay. And so God actually says, okay, we'll do it the earth way. Here, let's do this. He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And so notice now Abram doesn't say, well, what do you want them animals for? He knew what this was. He knew that this was the actual culture in the way that people make covenants. Okay. And so that's what he's doing. He brings these animals and he says, and he brought him all these, cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. So in other words, one on each side, okay? As he uh, opened up these animals and put them aside. This was the way they actually made an agreement back then. And so he says, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey, now Abram's there hanging out. Now, I think he's still in the vision, okay? He's still in the vision, but He's the one waiting now for God to come down and make this agreement. Because, see, both parties have to walk through 
these animals. And basically the statement that's being made, if either of us breaks this covenant, may we be as these dead animals that are on either side of us. That's, that's the way the contract was established, okay? And so he says, as he laid them over against each other, but he did not cut the birds in half. So they were laid out in their proper position. But these birds of prey apparently now in, in this vision, uh, probably uh, some buzzards came down and said, hey, fresh meat. They wanted it, right? Well, Abram's there. And, and so they came down on the carcasses because they were going to eat it. And Abram drove them away. In other words, Abram wouldn't let them defile this, this actual setup that was going to be there for this contract, this covenant between Abram and God. So as the sun was going down, now see, we get two pictures here, because when you look at it, at first it says the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So then it looks like he's asleep in this vision, but then it says again, now in verse 12, as the sun was going down, so in other words, while Abram was awake is when he made this, he killed these animals. He, he got the, he got the, the guidance for uh, actually carrying it out in the vision. But then he actually was awake when he put, brought all this to bear. So when he's trying to keep the buzzards and whatnot off of them, that was real. He, that part was not the vision. Because look at what happens. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. Now, this isn't a vision. God actually puts him to sleep, okay? And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And some would say, well, wait a minute. Why, if he's interacting with God, why is there this great darkness? So let's keep looking. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not there. Okay, now here, remember, we've been talking about offspring, and Martin had mentioned, you know, who those offspring are, that they are a spiritual area, but now here, this is not spiritual. This is actual physical offspring he's talking about. Here. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. Okay, now who were, who were they? Who was the ones, and what land did they go to? Where did they sojourn? Egypt? Egypt it was. How many years? Oh, four, a long time. 400. 400, 400 years. years. That's yep. right. 400 that's years good, yeah. that this was going to happen. So God's telling them there's going to be a dark period. Okay, that's why he's talking about there was darkness. Because as God reveals this to them, he's saying that there's going to be a problem. And I mean, it'll, it'll start out okay as long as Joseph and that Pharaoh were in charge. But after that, they got turned into slaves. They were building all the, you know, the pyramids and temples and all that that they all wanted, but they were slaves. They had, they were brick makers and everything. So he says, you will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, Egypt, and will be servants there, which is exactly what they were. And as a matter of fact, remember when we, uh, if you go into Exodus, start reading Exodus, you see, all the problems that were happening and with the people and that God heard their cry and came through Moses to, to get them out of the land of Egypt, right? So he says, you will be servants there. Now, remember, Pharaoh didn't want to let him go because, man, this was a lot of people and he, these, this was a lot of labor that he'd be losing. And he says, yeah. and they will be afflicted for 400 years, just as Martin indicated. But look what he says. But he, he provides a promise. He provides hope. God says, but I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, did they? Yes, they did. Absolutely. Yeah, but. but yeah, go ahead. I mean, I go back and, you know, you know the, analyzing the life of Abraham. I mean, it's, it's yeah. like, I would say it's easy for us to read that and just, ah, you know, it's okay, something that passed. <laughs> but we, we got to put ourselves in his shoes. Amen. I just read the little forward. Okay. So Abraham is 100 years old. Right. Okay. Uh, Sarah is 90 years old. That's right. Even though those, in those times, as you know, they, they live longer. Yeah. But like the Bible said, 
hot, her uh, womb was her, dried her up. tradition has passed. Right. So, you know, he, Abraham is just listening to God, like you mentioned. He doesn't question him, but deep inside, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this, this is something that's going to happen in the future. But right. looking at the present tense and the human perspective, it's impossible. Right. You know? But he chose to trust God. That's right. No matter what, he chose to trust God, which is a lesson for us. Sometimes Amen. we depend on circumstances and things that's going around. You know, if God has promised us a specific promise, it's going to happen. Amen. It's, and it's going to happen in God's time. But, Amen. you know, going back to Abraham, that's why he's called the father of faith. Because yep. he he trusted God, uh, even though the circumstances were, were you know, the were against uh, nature, basically. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful to actually see the picture, but it does make the statement of trusting God. And I mean, that hasn't changed. I mean, do we really trust God in spite of what our senses or our intellect or our emotions tell us? Do we really accept what God is saying he will do? And that's the key. No more. Look, Amen. if we get sick, we could still trust God. Amen. If we're going to die, we could still trust God. Amen. If we lost our possession, we could still trust God. No matter what, we could still trust God because he's Amen. faithful. Absolutely. So when you see exactly what he's talking about here, God's telling him exactly what's going to happen. And when God called Moses, he told him the same thing, by the way. He said, when you leave, you will ask for whatever you want. The people are going to give it to you. You know, ask for silver, gold, precious stones, whatever. Ask, and the people are just going to give it to you. And that's exactly what happened after all the plagues, right? <laughs> They're just like, just go. Here, take it, man. Just go. So, I mean, we see that that prophecy was fulfilled. And he says, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. So now he's talking about only Abram's lifespan. In other words, when he dies... It's going to be a peaceful death. He's going to go in peace. It's not going to be, you know, a warfaring kind of thing. But Abram's going to have a long and pleasant, relatively pleasant life. And God's taking care of him. Remember, he said he was his shield. Yeah. So that's what he's talking about here. As for you, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in good old age, 175 years. I'd say that's a pretty good age, right? Yeah, go ahead, Victor. Is that how long you're going to live? <laughs> no. Why does he say fathers as plural? Oh, okay. Um, because the way it worked, it was a patriarchal society back then, and everything was based on their father. So, in other words, the fathers that God is talking about here is Adam. He's talking about like Noah. He's talking about like Methuselah. He's talking about those that were the Enoch, he's talking about the righteous ones that came before Adam or before Abram and that they are with, you know, they, he would go be with them when they passed away. Okay. That's what he's referring to when he says fathers. I should have understood that when it was in lowercase f. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah, not God. Yeah, exactly. So that's, but they really use that a lot. As a matter of fact, for, since it was a very collectivistic, familiar kind of uh, culture that everybody, you know, built on their father. So it, the families kind of use their father's name. And that's why in, in the Jewish tradition, they say Ben Judah. In other words, I'm son of Judah. Not, uh, in other words, it's not about me. It's about what my father's, my family has done, you know, type of thing. And that's why they were named that way, because they were based on what their fathers had accomplished. And that's where their their word and their notoriety came from was based on their family line. So that's what God is talking about here. You shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now here he's talking, he's jumping back forward again. He's talking about when the people will come back from Egypt. Okay, once they, in other words, when they go to this land, they get taken away. In other words, 
I still have this land a portion for you. I told you that you're going to be in this land. This land is yours. But there's going to be a gap, is what he's saying. While, he, while they are sojourners, the land is waiting for them to come back. The Amorites will be one of the countries, one of the nations that they conquer when they come back, right? And so he's talking about that that's what's going to happen. It's not going to be in Abram's time. It's going to be, well, remember, even Jacob and Joseph have both died. It's going to be in Moses's time. So, I mean, we see that God is preparing that return because he says, look, it's going to be like in that fourth generation from the time that they leave the land. In other words, when Jacob and his family left the land, went to Egypt because Joseph called them down. It was in the fourth generation for the iniquity because the Amorites weren't at the level that God wanted them to be at to be conquered and overturned. Okay, so because he says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So in other words, it's God's timing is his timing. And he's going to work it out in his time. And he's got ways of measuring what his time is. And in this case, obviously, it had to do with the iniquity of the Amorites that was determining the time based on God's timeline. But when it gets to that point, then God will take action. See? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I'm Mark. just going back to, to verse uh, 14 there. Yeah. You know, God's telling Abraham what's going to happen to his, his, his uh, generation. Yeah. But as you can see right there, it says, okay, they're going to be slaves there, but God's going to bring, ju it's going to bring judgment uh, to that nation. Oh, yeah. And, and we see through the whole history, history of Israel, that God, how, how God uh, used nation, the wicked nation, to punish Israel, yep. right? Oh, yeah. But at the same time, they were responsible for the action. Yep. Right? Right. So it's like if we, if we apply that to our lives, there might be time that God will use our enemies to teach us a lesson, right? He, yes, he can. Absolutely. It's, it's like, you know, some people, some Christian people are fighting with what's going on with this nation today. And I'm saying to myself, you know what? Maybe God is involved here. Maybe God, <laughs> maybe God is bringing punishment to us because we have turned away from him. Right. So sometimes we got to be careful because God might be involved. And, sure. and, and, we, and we see that the history of, of Israel and that's exactly what happened. Yep. God used the nation to punish them. Yep. And that's how God works, by the way. And that's why the Old Testament is like, as Paul puts it, is an example for us because, hey, it, what happened back then applies today just as well. Because, I mean, remember what the New Testament says. Those who God loves, he disciplines, right? And, hey, some of that discipline may not be pleasant, as well, the way yeah. Paul puts it. Yeah. And, and, and it's for us to learn. Absolutely. The Old Testament, we cannot say, well, it only applied to Israel. No, nope. it's not true. Those lessons are there for us to learn also from them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And But we can see that God is sovereign through it all. And that's why we need Amen. to keep our eyes on him. Look at look at the <laughs> poor Egyptians. Well, not poor. God used them to his purpose and plan. Well, but man, right. Because the, the as you know, Pharaoh thought he was in control. He was a, yeah. he was a God. <laughs> oh, you know? yeah. so, so God said, okay, you want to be God? Okay, I'm going to show you who's in yeah. control. Amen. Amen. But I, I, I don't think it's come from punishment. I think it's like the way that I see it is like it's not punishment God wants to instruct us to do the right way but the punishment I, that my way to believe is come from like from evil from the bad thing from the sins that's what I think no well I know what I know what you're trying to say Julie um, God God discipline. Some remember, discipline is about teaching, it's about training, it's about getting people on the right path, teaching them what to do. Now, sometimes God has to do some really tough things to get certain of his children's attention and get them back on the right path. And yeah, in some cases, it, it may be pretty stiff discipline 
that could very easily look like punishment per se. Okay, but it's it, God will do what he has to do to get us on the right path. So, yeah, it may be, I mean, even Paul makes it clear that some of, some of that discipline that we may have to go through will not be pleasant for that time, you know, while we're going through it. But as long as the whole key issue is that God wants to keep us on the right path to follow him. I mean, look at, look at uh, the Jews throughout all of the Old Testament. They, they were always wandering away from God, weren't they? But yet we see that God had to use other nations. And I mean, a lot of times they got, you know, beaten in wars and things like that because God needed to get their attention back on him and get their attention off of those other gods from those nations. So, it's, like, it's like, you know, the people that they're in jail and you go as a minister, minister, minister them mm -hmm. and not because they already they're sorry and they really forgive they still have to pay for what they did, but they actually repent of what they did, but they still have to pay for the punishment because, you know, you did something wrong. So you have to, it's not like pay for, it's pay for what you had done wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. uh, there are consequences <laughs> to sin. I think that's what you're trying to say. And yeah. the issue is God will forgive us our sin through Jesus Christ. But sometimes there are sin that we do that affect are civil, you know, interactions. And there, we have accountability for those. I mean, we could be taken to jail, even though Jesus has forgiven us for it, it, it. Jesus doesn't interact with our government and say, hey, I've already forgiven him or her, so you don't have to worry about it. No, we have a responsibility to be able to meet the requirements. As a matter of fact, God's clear that we have to be at peace and live within our government's requirements, that those leaders were put in there to, to avoid you know to deal with evil in our nation and sometimes those sins we do can be evil and our nation will take us to the court and throw us in jail or do you know whatever is needed to be able to uh address the fact that we have done something against the law yes so do you think that sickness coming from like a punishment from god or is is from sin because like I thought God is, is a God of love, that he will not punish you, but he will correct you. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, how do you define love, God's love, Julie? Direct, he will direct you to the right path. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. If he has to do it by being stern with you, do you think he'll do that? What does the stern mean? Stern means... To be to do it in a harsh way or a more focused way that may not be pleasant. A more strict, more yeah, strict it, way. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to, you don't have no choice. You well, have that, to. see, that's the issue. A lot of times, see, there's a lot of this gospel going on out there today that says, oh, God is love, so he's not gonna do this or this or this. But you have to understand that God also is just. In other words, he also wants us to be who he wants us to be. He doesn't want to just say, oh, I love you. So yeah, go ahead and do whatever you want to. No, he says, I love you. And so I'm going to make you into what I want you to be. And in some cases, it requires some pretty stiff penalties that we go through as he disciplines us. Okay. But does that mean he doesn't love us? No. On the contrary, it means he does love us because he wants us to be who he wants us to be. Not, not after our flesh, but after the spirit and the way he wants us to reflect him. That's why he does it. And that's why sometimes we may have to endure illnesses or other issues in our life. It's not because he doesn't love us. He does it because he does love us and he's trying to get our attention to get us back on the right track. By the same token, I think that a lot of illness is simply because we're in a fallen world. We're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. So because we're in this world that we lost the water protection during the flood, things are just going to happen because it's life. You know, heredity has been messed up because of sin. So we're going to inherit certain things. And it all hopefully is telling us to keep our eyes on the Lord and say, Okay, Lord, you're greater than what heredity says or 
whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the reality is sin is sin, and sin yeah. is out there. Go ahead, Mark. You know, we, we have to understand that God is a sovereign God. Amen. Right? Nothing moves without his, his authority or That's control. Right. Even, even the enemy, Satan himself, is on the authority of God. So right. whatever God uses is for his own glory at the end. But yes, he will use evil also. That's right. I'm not saying God's, God, God practiced evil, never. But he will use the enemy right. to accomplish his, for, his, for his honor and glory. We have seen through the Bible. Exactly. But, but everything is going back to Genesis at the beginning, right? He told uh, Adam and Eve that they do you eat of this fruit, you surely die. Right. So basically anything that uh, that is it happened to our life, sickness and situation, is back to, to sin. Yes, there is consequence of sin. Yeah. It's not a direct punishment to us directly. So I got sick, God's punishing me. No. Well, you know, if you look at the global picture, yeah, everything that happens in this in, in, in this earth, it has to do because of sin. Otherwise, it were not happen. But it's not a direct punishment to us. No, it, it is normal. It's like some people say, okay, why this happened to me? Well, why not? Are we exempt? No. Why not? The Bible people... says it rains on the just and on the unjust. I mean, yeah. Amen. There are people, they actually get sick and they actually end up looking for God. And it, it should not be that way, but actually that's, some people do that. They what? do what? I'm sorry. I, I didn't <laughs> quite understand that, that Joel. They are, they are not believers. And when they get sick, they actually start looking for God and they end up, you know, accepting even Jesus. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> hey, sometimes that may be what God has to do to get their attention. Yeah. Do you think that those churches that that they actually been created, actually that I have seen that is more for the youth. Do you think they're doing it the right way that letting the youth to do whatever they want, but on the same way, trying to guide them. Or do, I, I think that's wrong, but some kids get safe, some kids know. So what do you think of those church that they're doing that? I, I, I'm not real sure exactly what it there's is. That some, there are some churches like they're, they let the teenagers do whatever they want, but not the right, you know, even that is not the right way. It's like, uh, for example, there is in these days, there are people in churches living together and they not even married, they, but oh, they still, I see what you're the, saying. Church, the church is still accepted. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if these are people in a church, I mean, Jesus even made it clear that if people are allowed just to basically run rampant in a church and do whatever they want to, and there is no accountability that's problematic. It's problematic because it affects the whole body of Christ. It's not just the one person. It's what that person is doing to the body of Christ, especially if nobody else is calling them on. I mean, that was the same problem in Corinthians with the Corinthians, where that one guy was living with his mother-in-law and nobody was saying anything about it. They were letting it happen. And Paul had to call him on the carpet and say, hey, I've already judged that guy. You know, get him out of there. He's not even supposed to be in there because he, by them becoming apathetic, just saying, well, whatever, if that's what he wants to do, God's love, that's fine. It affects the whole church body. But see, that's why we have Amen. to have accountability in the church that says, hey, if you say you're a, you're a member of this church body, then you have to be growing like the church body. If you're causing problems and disruption in the church body, you're causing divisions in the church body, church discipline has to jump in there. And if the person doesn't repent in the church discipline, as Jesus put it, how it's carried out, then you're supposed to let them, you're supposed to let them get out and leave the church body because they're infecting the rest of the people if you let it stay. And, and so, we, yeah, we, the church body is there to walk with the Lord in his right. righteousness, not in the world's way. And, right. and we've, got that, we've got that problem in the church way too much mm -hmm. today that we just accept things of the world's culture and, and let it be okay in the churches. And we need to be more proactive on That's those right. issues 
and hold people accountable because that's not what people are supposed to be doing in the church. We're supposed to be growing and becoming more like Christ, becoming disciples, be united, be loving. We're not Christ. supposed to be looking like the rest of the world. That's right. We've got to yeah. look different. If we're looking yeah. like the world, then we got a problem. Mm -hmm. And we are. And so, yeah, those are problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So to hate the sin of this world. Amen. Not that's, to love the world. that's what we're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, as you know, the, the churches are not preaching the holiness of God. That word is not right. even mentioned anymore. That's, that's right. right. Holy, holy, holy is the word, is the Lord. Lord God Almighty. And, and, and as, as Isaiah that says it. That's, yep. The emphasis three times was let's listen to uh, I think it was I just brought today about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know the second level is not two, right? Holy, holy. Right. But when you mention number three, three, that's like the highest. That's it. You know, like today that's we right. we use uh underline quotation and so on. It's to make emphasis. That's right. And and it, it's a shame that people want they, they want to <laughs> the words coming to the church instead of us being different. No, we want to be like them. That's it. You know what, right. what, what changes people is the word of God. What had changed, yeah. what changed my life? It wasn't the music. It was the word of God that opened yeah. my eyes, that quickened my heart. It's yep. nothing else. It's not, it's not, it's not the lights, gaming, stuff like that. It doesn't work. Because you know what? They will come and they will leave. Yep. And it's but, not my truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. No. God's truth is the only truth. Yeah. And that is the powerful Amen. thing there amen, amen. there's and some so, people i'm sorry go there's ahead some, Julie. there's some people they just go for the pastor and where the pastor is not there that's right oh i'm like what is the point you even going for the church i'm like the church that's right. is in you and you be should be you know taking the work of everyone everywhere not being there just for a pastor the pastor mm -hmm. is just leading by god that's right I mean, that's we've got to realize that who are we following? Are we mm -hmm. following man or are we following Christ? And I had a friend one time that was look, shopping around for a church and she said, well, this church has good music. <laughs> yeah, that was so perplexing to me. At that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but you're right, Gene. Yeah. That's that's happens out there. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. they call it the menu, the menu church system. In other words, you look for a church based on what you want the church body to be. And you uh, say, what are okay, the amenities? Let yeah. me look at the amenities. <laughs> yeah, I want one that has this kind of entertainment. I want one that has this kind of air conditioning. They have to have this kind of lighting. They have to have this kind of pastor. And they and, and, and what they're looking at, they're looking at the things that satisfy them. They're not saying, mm -hmm. what do I need to grow? What? I want one that has, a, you know, an integral body of Christ with discipleship programs right. that show that people are becoming more like Christ, that they're invested in getting the good news out, that they're active in their faith, and they have a passion for serving God. Usually, Amen. those aren't the ones they're looking for. They're right. looking for all these other things that satisfy the self. And, okay. and, and that's instead of saying, part. Lord, where are you leading me? Which and, church do exactly. you want me in? Yep. Because yeah. hey, that's what we are as the body of Christ. We're in Him. We're mm -hmm. representing Him. That, that's that right. is because we want to be entertained. That, okay? That's we right. Be, we don't want to be fed the Word of God. We want mm -hmm. to be entertained. And, and that's entertained the instead of, and our entertainment should be. Yeah. Let me see how I can give glory to God, Lord. Work in me so I can bring glory to You. Let me worship You. <laughs> Whatever the music is, let me bring worship to You through it. You know. Mm -hmm. I want to be so entertained I go 10 miles away see you there <laughs> praise God <laughs> it's like I saw one time a church that they say I will touch you with my touch you will fall down and you will be <laughs> and you will be able to walk I'm like what is this I'm like did it I work no but it's actually <laughs> it's just like you see all of these people they just like even giving money to them because they think they're going to start walking. Yeah, yeah. That's heresy. It's, it's that. It is. It is. It it's, is. It's false. It's false worship. And, and that's, that's right. what And I mean, God's going to hold them accountable big time. Big time. You know, mm -hmm. and that's if they even have their names written in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because I mean, hey, the, uh, James chapter three makes it really clear that those that are leading those congregation, whether pastors or teachers, they're going to be held at a higher level of accountability because of the fact that they, uh, you know, affected so many people. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can, can we call that a church? Yeah, well, that's the question. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, these are real things that are going on. But let's get back over here. Let's get back over here uh, and finish up this covenant thing. <laughs> but it's but we can see the roots of the issues we've been talking about all the way back here, just even in a covenant between God and Abram. OK, amen. So he says in verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So you say. What's this smoking fire pot and this flaming torch? What's this all about? Remember with Moses and the burning bush? God represents himself in different ways. He, when he comes and he reveals himself and he lets himself be known as to who he is. In this case, he was a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch when he went through these, these uh, cut up animals and whatnot as an agreement to the covenant that he was making with Abram. And oh, so, okay. So he says, okay, on that uh, flaming pot passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made the covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, I, I don't, I don't remember if it was David or in Solomon's time, <laughs> That's when they had the most amount of land. I don't remember if it, I think it reached all the way to Euphrates with Solomon, but they've lost a lot of that since, okay? But anyway, but see, what we have to understand is that in this covenant, that land is theirs. So we know that that has to come back into play, okay? So to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Catamanites, the Hittites, uh, did I miss something? The Gashites and the Jebusites. So in other words, back then at the time of Abram, these were nations that were currently inhabiting these, these areas where, um, where Abram was at. Now, let me see, I wonder if I can um, get a map to kind of show that. Let me see. I had problems last time doing that, but let me try Genesis 15, uh, verse. Is there such a river called Egypt? Well, he, he, they're talking about, I think he's talking about the Nile. The Nile is the river that deals with, you know, uh, Egypt, but, um, so that's the only one that I could draw a conclusion from when he talked about that. But let me see here. Let me see what we got here. Um, trying to see where the Euphrates is at. Okay, there's the Euphrates. Okay, let me share this out. Hang on. And come on. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, there we go. Okay. Now, what we have here, see, this is the Sinai Peninsula down here. The Euphrates is this river here. Can you see that? Yeah. Or is it too light? I can't see your cursor. Oh, okay. Um, hang on, hang on. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger here. Um, well, anyway. It, I can't it, see it. You cannot... Ben. Oh, okay. It would basically it would be from here just to the west of the P Sinai Peninsula. This is the Nile here, and that means that it would include all this land all the way up here to Euphrates. See, Euphrates is up here, and see here's Damascus. Right now, Israel is only like from here. Here's the Sea of Galilee right here. Here's the Dead Sea. Israel right now is only this little piece right here. But look at what God promised. God promised all the way from here, Euphrates, 
all the way down here to basically the Nile, the river of Egypt, all of that land. So, I mean, it really makes you wonder, hey, that's got to come back into play, right? Yep. Because, I mean, that's part of that covenant. And so as we look at that, we realize God's got a plan. It may not look the way we see it. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think in Solomon's time, they had that much land, by the way. And I think that was about the time that they had the most land uh, was in Solomon's day. Uh, to, and remember, because God had made his reigning a whole peaceful reign, right? And none of the nations were at war with Solomon the whole time he was in office. So, and he, his borders were about as expanded a little even further than what David had during his reign. I think it did get all the way up to Euphrates, but I, it never reached down to the Nile that I'm aware of. So, so we see that in this covenant, God still has a plan and he's going to carry it out in his time and in his way. And he promised it, you know, because he, he's saying it. Didn't he say that right here in verse 18? On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt, which the only, the main river of Egypt is the Nile. We saw that. It, we'll see that when we get to the, to the actual, the 10 plagues that he puts on the Egyptians when Moses goes there. The Nile gets, gets hammered pretty good with blood, doesn't it? to the great river, the river Euphrates. So that's a lot of land compared to what Israel has today. And part of the prophecy also says that the, the Jews are gonna come back to Israel. So, and we see that already happening today. There are many that are already coming back. Well, they need more land. They're gonna need more land to have all those Jews come back. And so, you know, right now they're settling them in the, in the Golan Heights which is disputed land anyway. And so in essence, though, that is land that God promised to the Jews. So, so you're saying you think they're going to get it back? It's not just going to stay this little tiny country that it is right I, now? I, I, that's, that's the way I understand it based okay. on what I see, you know, the, the covenant saying. Because it's never had that much land as, as what this covenant is indicating. So God has to, you know, carry that out he's got to make it happen so that's why i'm saying it god always works out the covenant the question is he does it when does he do it and he does it in his time so yeah it, it wouldn't surprise me it wouldn't surprise me that you know we would we would start seeing an increase in the amount of land it wouldn't surprise me. you know how a lot of these nations come against the jews you know, the Arabs really like to come against the Jews. Maybe it's the Syrians. Maybe it's uh, the Lebanese. Um, but it, all it takes is for them to conquer that nation, the Jews to conquer that nation, and they've got that land. You know, I mean, I know the United Nations wouldn't be happy with it, but the issue is, you know, hey, little Israel, who's going to say, hey, you're being a meanie if it's little Israel and it's these big nations that are coming against it? They're just, well, God's got power over the United amen. Nations. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we see that there are things within the covenant that haven't been carried out yet. So we know since it's God making the covenant, it will be carried out in its time, in God's time. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at that and we can see that it's going to cover all of that land and it will happen. It will happen. So... I think that's as far as we're going to get today, though, um, because it's already 717. And uh, but I mean, it's beautiful to see that God is there for him. And I think the big takeaways from the covenant that we'll see have to do with the fact that even though Abram and and Sarai are so advanced in age and as my, Milton was or I mean, Milton, as Martin was putting it. Uh, you know, I mean, these are things that you would say, well, wait a minute here. They're already past age, you know, to really be able to have a child. But God is telling them that they are going to have an offspring and it will be his offspring. That means his and Sarai's offspring. That will be the son of promise through the covenant that God is talking about. So I think it's interesting because Adam 
in Adam's day, they were living 900 years. And then Noah's day, they were living <laughs> 600 years. And now Abraham, 165 is old. Yeah, I don't know how many generations there are between Abraham and Adam, but it's really gone down. Oh, yeah. Well, and the the ages went down after the flood. It wasn't really while they were on the other side of the flood, the ages were long. But once once God broke the heavens and, you know, because it was that bubble of water around the earth, I think that made the place a clean environment and these bodies would live longer in that type of environment that it filtered out all the uv rays all the issues that would make the bodies age quicker oh. and so i that's why i think the bodies then started decaying a lot faster coming down faster because i mean even though even though noah was in the 900 year range uh his offspring really decreased fast and it as we were studying right at, you know, chapter nine and 10, you could see that ages dropped relatively quickly. And so I think there's only about four generations since Noah, or five generations since Noah. And we can see that Abraham lives 175 years. You know, so we can see that the ages are dropping. And after Abraham, they even decrease more. And before you know it, no, you know, people aren't living but about 100 to 125 years. And that's the longest ones, you know. Yeah. And look at us today. We're trying to fight to be able to live another 10 years above what it is that we're destined to live, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, I mean, we're surprised to see somebody that actually makes it to 100 these days. That's right. Yeah. So. So, anyway. So that's where we're at today. So any other questions, anything that we've been talking about that isn't clear or needs some, you know, uh, addressing, or if you have any uh, issues or questions, disagreements, anything that you want to talk about, about what we're talking about in this covenant and how the Old Testament applies to us today as to how, you know, seeing what happened then and how it applies to us today through Jesus Christ. You said when, when Jesus said uh, it is finished, mm -hmm. it translates to the contract is. Fulfilled. That's right. It, yeah, the, the contract is paid. Right. And, and it's done. Which contract was that? The one? new covenant. That's that's well, actually, it was the establishment of the new covenant when the price was paid. The price was God's price that was required for God's wrath to be diverted from sin. And that's the price that was paid by Jesus dying. And in, in and through Jesus paying that price, the new covenant, the good news was established. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, the, that's why the father sent the son in as a human being, because that's the only way that blood could be shed, perfect blood could be shed to, to be the, uh, the, the payment, basically. The for, propitiation yeah, of propitiation, sin. Yeah, the propitiation of sin. In other words, Jesus paid the price for it all through his blood and carrying out the Father's will. Yeah. I mean, now that is love. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is amazing. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I will say that, you know, the going back to what we said before about the 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 blessing of Abraham of offspring. Right. I guess fulfilling in, in Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the ultimate right there. Right there. Because uh, as I mentioned before, today uh, it's being expanded. Every time a, every time a, 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 a soul comes to Christ, Amen. well, the nation is expanding every day. Amen. It's a blessing. And it's all through Jesus because there's salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, all the prophecy was pointing to, to Christ. That's it. That's what it all points to, isn't it? Whether it's pointing forward from the Old Testament or pointing back through the New Testament, it's always pointing to the cross, isn't it? To Jesus and what he did. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you. Yeah, go ahead, Victor. I think, I think Victor. Euphrates River is in uh, the country of Iraq and Syria right now. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, I'll tell you. So those countries would have to come into submission, wouldn't they, to be given up that land? Some pretty violent countries. Oh, yeah. They're Arabs. Yeah. Did you have something else, Martin? Oh, the question is, <laughs> yeah. no, and that prophecy, will that be fulfilled uh, during the reign of Israel? Oh, it will be fulfilled when Christ comes. See, that's a, that's that, that's one something to, to question about. Oh, that's right? a that's a good way. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because I, like big to say, let me tell you, I don't know unless they become under Israel, <laughs> I don't see how they're going to take over the land. Yeah, but uh, God knows why it might Maybe be a, a big at, war. It might be it might be at the end time when Christ comes. It could be. right because of the point be. is God didn't say when it's going to be nope. fulfilled. That nope. is, Going to be fulfilled. That's right. And it will be fulfilled, but it'll be in God's time. Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. And his time is perfect because Absolutely. he only wants the best for us. I think even when we go through discipline and all that, we think, oh, he's mad at me. No, he's wanting us to learn something. So it's like, okay, Lord, help me learn so I can get through this really quick, you know. And <laughs> Amen. Because he knows what's best for us. He wants us. We don't realize it, and he knows what he's holding on the other side, that he needs to work us and grow us to appreciate that when we get there. Amen. And, and oh. is, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. How could I answer a question to a person that say, where is God where I need it the most? The same place he's always been. He's right. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's I mean, the question, I know what they're asking. In other words, why didn't God, you know, take me out of this problem? Why didn't he, you know, uh, relieve me from it? I'll tell you what, any, see, this is what's hard to understand and people don't want to accept because people associate that if they have to go through a hard time, that it's because God doesn't love them. That's and so, right. And so the issue is this, though. God allows what needs to happen to a person to open their eyes to a situation as to whether they will accept that or not. That's the individual that has to be brought to that attention. I mean, it's not something that God, it's not like God's up there with this whip saying, okay, Ted, you need five lashes because you've been terrible today. You know, actually, I think he does do that for you, Ted. Oh, it's, well, you're not supposed to be looking at me when I take my shirt off, but, uh, <laughs> but no, the issue is, is that God's not up there that way. He's not a vindictive guy. God is a God of love. That's right. But you've got to understand what God's love is. God's love isn't this, this, oh, really nice, benevolent leader that just wants everything Utopia. to be happy, happy, nippy, nappy, all that kind of living. <laughs> God's love sometimes may require stiff discipline. And some uh, the Bible's clear that some of that discipline will not be pleasant at the time while you have to endure it. That's right. The question is, did you learn from the That's discipline? Right. Did you come through it looking to the Lord and saying, thank That's you for right. that, Lord. Now I've got my focus back on you. Thank you for mm -hmm. that discipline. See, the thing is, is most people that don't have a relationship with him Mm -hmm. want to blame him for everything if That's it's right. not what they want if if they don't have everything working the way they want it to work yeah. who do they blame it's got to be god that's doing that's right. that you that's know right. god is not a god of love because if he was i wouldn't be going through and fill in the blank yeah. right yeah that's human nature that's humankind but when you get to know the lord you realize that everything that you experience once you're in him, it comes from him and you, you get this appreciation that he wants the best for you through whatever situation you're enduring. And what that does is it lets you experience him deeper. And most of the time you'll find that God keeps you at peace when you're walking with him in the way that honors and glorifies him. It, it, you know, it and it's all to bring the body of Christ together. Sure. So if something happens, 
then you can help another brother or sister that maybe has gone through a similar thing. And, there you go. As, you as know, a unity, that would be helpful. Yeah, yep. yeah. So, but the Bible is also clear that God keeps him in perfect peace whose eyes are steadfast on you. In other words, it, when we keep our eyes on the Lord, he keeps us in peace. And that's exactly what we read in the covenant here too with Abram, didn't we? That God promised that he would be at peace and that he would live a long life and he would go to his fathers in peace. See, that's the issue. When your eyes are steadfast on the Lord, when you trust in him, you walk in his peace. He gives that's you right. peace. That's and right. That's not an easy thing to understand because people say, well, wait a minute. When I go through this trial, I, uh, that hurts. Well, but the, the question then is, God, what are you trying to teach me by mm -hmm. what I'm enduring here today? And learn right. from it and move on. And I guarantee you that it, you'll come out better for it on the other side and, and under God's strength. And since the word says, count it all joy, okay, even when you're so broken and there's no way you can count it all joy, say, okay, I'm supposed to count this all joy. And really, it's just changing your mindset to have God's peace over you because God hasn't gone anywhere. He's always there. And Amen. when things happen, it doesn't mean he runs away. He's there to hold you even more. Here, there, and everywhere. Amen. Yeah, yeah Martin, did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, there might, may be time that we cut our life short on this earth because of disobedience to God or sin. Absolutely. You know, there, there's, there's a, I think it's in the Old Testament that says that uh, the children that disobey their parents or this this uh, dishonor their parents, their life will be cut short, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if people decide to practice sin, is either, you know, they, they choose this life, or even though they're not Christian, but they choose this life or, or, or constantly sinner, as you, I mean, we've seen, we seen different people, right? Oh, yeah. They cut their life short. It's either they get killed by, by someone, mm -hmm. or they die with drug, drug overdose, or whatever sin they're practicing, because, you know, they, they reap what they saw, right? Yep. So, you know, sin has consequences. Yes, it does. But, yes, but where are those people that they're Christian, for example, I have two friends they are going situation, for example, I have one friend that she just lost recently her son of cancer. Her husband now is battling in cancer and having surgery next week. And she's answering me, where is God? I, I pray and I don't see his answer. He take my son. Now he's taking my husband. And I'm like, I'm trying to lift her up. And I'm like, well, it's I, like maybe she was looking for the wrong answer. You know, we expect the things to be answered our way. And what? since this is what happened, the Lord is wanting to draw you nearer to him, not to make you mad, but to help grow you. Because look what happened with Job. Oh my goodness, he was a righteous man. And everything was taken away from him. So God is, yeah, to encourage her that God's there. That's why I told her, actually, sometimes you have to lose everything to see how, you know, because God will never give you what you can handle. But That's right. You have to lose everything or give everything to God because maybe it's something that God wants to teach you, even that you see it the wrong way. But remember, I told her that this is a permanent word, that we just have to continue our faith, but never lose right. your faith. I told her, never lose your faith, because if you lose your That's faith, right. you lose everything. I like the way you put that there, where it all belongs to God. So it's not your son. It's not your husband. This is God's son. This is God's husband. So Lord, you know, Take care. I know you're doing with him what you want to do with him and show me how to show your mercy and grace to my husband who's now got cancer. And because I mean, that's a good example right there, Yvonne, of you and um, Julie, of you and Eva, Ivan, that, you know, you're not, oh, woe is me. Why are we sick like this? You're, hey, we're here for each other. What can I do to encourage you? Let's build our faith in God. And that's the only thing that'll get us through. And I don't know if I answer her why, but I told her, look, we are human. Sometimes we will feel that way, 
but you just have to surrender yourself and just continue. Don't lose your faith because from all of that, even that you don't see it now, the blessing that's coming is bigger. You might not see it now, but you're going to see it in God's time. Amen. Amen. Because people want to go by their emotions and you can't go by your emotions when you lose someone or someone's sick. That's a lot of emotion. That's a lot of pain. But God is greater than all that. I, I think you gave her good advice, Julie. You gave her good yeah. advice. Um, because it, what it comes down to, hey, think about Job again, like Sally said. What did he <laughs> say when he found out all his children were dead, you know, and he had lost everything? He said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So everything that happens fits into God's economy. You know, and he uses everything for our good is what the Bible said. Amen. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's in Romans 8, 28. So right. when we look at that, we have to have faith that what God is doing Regardless, even if it's something that's hard to bear, he's mm -hmm. doing it for our good at some level. So we, I'm not saying that it won't be painful or that we won't have, we won't have a big sense of loss. I'm just saying that in the process, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord because he is our hope and stay, not anything this world offers, but what he offers. And, and Because and, hey, what the world has to offer is going to only be temporary and then we'll be sad again mm -hmm. and, and the issue is if if her son and her husband are in christ jesus think about it yes it may be painful and hard for a short period of time here but in the end she will get to go be with them and they will be together for all eternity true and not having to deal with sin and pain and sickness and illness and everything else that we have to deal with here on earth you know yeah i, I know those aren't easy i know people even christians have trouble with that because they feel like there is some kind of vindictiveness in god allowing those things to happen but we have to accept without any sway of misconfidence in god that he is love it he cares for us so much that he wants the best for us but some of that may be dealing with painful issues so that we keep our eyes on him it's like sometimes it takes forever to answer but it's just i asking god to give me the right word so you know so it doesn't it is it make her feel more comfortable more happier and, and take it out from that amen uh, no they, i understand she was like one day she was like oh you took too long and i'm like no i was just trying to find the right words for you to understand it yeah yeah because i mean in the end what god wants is just tell her that she, he, god wants the best for you mm -hmm. because he loves you so mm -hmm. much that's really what it comes down to julie you know because god does love her so much and at least you weren't using one of the um lame lines of Oh, well, God needed another angel in heaven. No, those kinds of comments aren't helpful. So like you said, you told her you were taking the time to pray so that you would be able to come with edifying words for her. Yeah. And sometimes I don't even apply those words to me. I say, God, you give me this word, but I'm like, <laughs> I do myself. Yeah, but then, yeah, letting it work on us is a different yeah. issue, right? I, I can tell you about it, but man, don't don't make me have to deal with it, Lord. Big time, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you, Julie. Believe me, Lord I hear is, you. Lord and God hears you too. What's that, Victor? So the Lord is speaking through you. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Amen. Okay, any other final questions, comments before we get into prayer items? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just but we, a comment, Julie's friend, they say losing a child is the most painful. Oh, man, no kidding. I'll tell you, talk about something that can really test your faith, right? Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, exactly. Oh, mercy me. That's who sings, I can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> mercy me. Yeah, there you go. 
Oh my God. But then to have the faith to know that even if your child in that horrible pain that you never get over, but the Lord is always there to comfort you and to rock you in his arms, whatever it takes for you to make a visual that, okay, Lord, you're rocking me in your arms because you were sad too that I had to lose my son, you know, because that is, that, well, that's so God, painful. Well, God had to, you know, put up his son. And he You're lost not his kidding. Son. Yeah. And he did nothing wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, think about that. You know, if God That's had right. to do it, but he did it for all mankind, you know, before also. and after. Amen. Yeah. God is awesome. God is awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. What prayer items do we have, folks? I've got Julie here for the air conditioning in her house to start working. Oh, goodness. Yes. <laughs> Another prayer, my that, that friends, her husband, they're taking to off. He just got out. They take him out from Orlando Regional, and he's getting transferred to Moffitt. And Tuesday, he having brain surgery. Oh, okay. So two. The one your... that her name. Uh, his name is Martin. Okay, Martin. Yeah. Brain surgery, huh? Brain surgery. He had cancer tumor. Oh man. In his brain. And I have another friend, Vanessa, that she has on uns on unspoken prayers. She's been a severe, very depressed. I've been trying to lift her off, talking okay. to her. Plus, continue praying with for Vangelis and Van Julier. It's so funny because now she, she just had, you know, the uh, Mercedes have her other child. And she's been asking Van Julier, oh, or how could I ask? to be uh, put that guy in child support, Evangelia was like, I don't know, I put myself to forgive to my daughter because I want to. So don't ask me, you have to figure it out. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'll tell you, but nothing's impossible for God, but we leave it in yeah. his hands because in the end, it That's has right. to be his will, not our exactly. will. Exactly, you know? yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, I got those. What else do we have for prayer uh, items? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yes, you remember Socrates from church, right? Socrates, Paris? Yeah, Socrates, uh-huh. You know, Socrates, uh, he had a heart attack. I think no way. Yesterday. No yeah. way. Yeah, that's what I say when I got the text this morning. Oh, my. Oh. Is he in the hospital? It happened today is a Wednesday. I believe it happened probably Tuesday night. Wow. Oh, yeah, my. He's in the hospital right who's, now. Who's okay. in the hospital? Uh, it's, a, it's a member from our church. Yeah. His yeah. name is Socrates Perez. Yeah. And he was a oh. preacher for the Spanish speaking church at one time. That's basically lovely a man. Lovely man. Wow. Yeah. He's a great brother in Christ. I'm telling mm -hmm. you. He's, he's awesome. Yes, he is. Well, we'll be lifting. We're lifting so well, this up. I mean, he's, he's uh, according to the uh, text that I got this morning, he's, he's in recovery. In other words, they did already they open up the. Uh, the open heart surgery. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, so wherever he, he had a few blockage. I think. Oh yeah, it's oh. different. I guess what the pastor went through. Wow, mm -hmm. my goodness. And yeah. he, and again, he doesn't seem that old. So no, he's a guy. No. He, he's probably 61, 61. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's still young. Sixty-two, maybe the most. And he's not. You know, it's, it's not like he was overweight and like no, that. No, no, no. Things happen. That's well, right. It's life. Yeah, like but happened. we will pray for him. Amen. Yeah. That's what we could do. Mm -hmm. Yes, guys in control. I'm glad Amen. you brought that up, Martin. I hadn't heard. Yes, I hadn't heard. Well, I to that. I was surprised you sent me a text. Uh -huh. He's telling me, Oh, at, uh, one day my wife slept last night, so he assumed, I guess, that I knew. Oh, my okay, I didn't know. So I'm trying to say, Where it sounds like he's what's he happened. talking about? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sent him a, re a reply, say, What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I got Dorka's uh, voicemail, and then she she explained it to me. Ah, wow. uh, gotcha, gotcha. Praise the Lord! He was talking though. That's a positive sign right there. Boy, well, with it he, having just happened to me by text, it was a text I received from. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. but still, that he was communicative. Oh yeah, yeah that he was. Thinking. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we'll definitely be lifting him up for full recovery. Yeah, so it sounds and, like he came through the operation okay. Praise God. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? 
Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Bible study and how you have showed us such wonders that we find in your word that aren't just limited to what you did back thousands of years ago, but how it impacts us today and how Jesus was pivotal in the whole matter of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and how it points to the wonder of your plan and how you're carrying it out today amongst the offspring of Abraham who are in the church, us, we, the believers in Christ. Oh man, you are awesome, Lord, and the way you've worked things out. And we know that you'll continue to work them out according to your word up until the time that, you know, this world is finally taken away and we have the new heaven and the new earth. Boy, I, I just can't wait to be with you. I, I liked what Paul said. It is better to be with Christ, but I stay with you even a little longer because it is necessary. So we are here to fulfill what God wants in and through us, just as God was using Abram at that time. And Abraham became the father of many nations. And, and we see that even today, your covenant with Abraham is still being fulfilled. It is still being carried out. What awesome wonder you have displayed in those who love you, Lord. So we ask now as we, as we continue to seek you, Lord, that we would continue to grow in you, to get to know you better, to love you more. And to become more like Christ in everything we do, that we would be obedient and, and our faith and trust would be in you at such a level to where we can walk in your righteousness and reflect you, Lord Jesus, in all things. Now, Lord, I pray for Julie and her home. You know all of the problems she's been having with that home, but now the AC is out, Lord. I pray that they would get that resolved right away. Because you know that they need it in the house. They need the temperature down. And, you know, it's difficult for breathing when it gets hotter. So, Lord, please resolve that matter rapidly. Have, have the right people come in that can do exactly what needs to be done to get that system working again. And that they would have it available and functional. And we thank you even now for what not only what you're doing, but what you will do in the process. Thank you, Lord. I also want to pray for Martin who's going in for brain surgery. Lord, man, you know um, that he, he, they're gonna be removing this tumor from his brain. But Lord, we ask that you be with those the surgeons, that you would give them wisdom and insight that your hands would guide the operation and that Martin would be able to come through that operation successfully, I pray. And we look to you, Lord, because when it all comes down to it, it is you that has to be functional in this, in this system of recovery. So we pray for direction to, of, the, of the surgeons and also for the recovery for Martin to be able to overcome this issue, Lord, I pray. I also wanna pray for Vanessa's unspoken request. We lift her up to you, Lord. You know that and she's also battling depression and Lord, that can be a really dysfunctional you know, uh, condition that a person has. So Lord, I pray that you would show her your mighty works and, and show her your peace, Lord. Lift her up. Let her know that you're near. Let her see that, man, you're right there and that you want to be who you would have her be. And Lord, so I pray that you would just lift her up, lift Vanessa up and meet any of the unspoken requests that she has, Lord. And we thank you even now. I pray for Vangelis, Lord, as she continues in her schoolwork and, and, and the issues that she's dealing with in terms of the hip pain and the other issues. We lift her up to you, Lord. We ask that you give her peace. Give her, give her direction and guidance in her daily walk with you. And as she does her academics and any of the uh, other physical exercises that she has to do, Lord, that you would just be with her. Let her know that you're near and that no matter how bleak certain things may look, that you have not left her, that you're always beside her because you said that you will never leave or forsake her, Lord. So we look to you to help build her up. Also pray for Van Julier, Lord, that you would be with him 
and also with little, you know, uh, Isabelita, Lord, that you, you would just give peace to the family there and that little Isabelita would, you know, have peace too as she's kind of being shuttled around because of the family breakup issue. But I pray for, you know, Isabelita's mother. I continue to lift her up, Lord. She needs to come to you. I ask that you just, you know, open her eyes, open up her heart and mind, that she may see that this world has nothing to offer that's of any value, and that the only true peace comes from you, and that that's what she needs in her life. So we look to you, Lord, and we pray for your direction and guidance, not only with Van Julier and Isabelita, but with, their, with her mother. Lord, we look to you, because in, apart from you, we can do nothing. Now, Lord, I also want to lift up Socrates. I thank you for, you know, the fact that apparently when he had his heart attack, he was able to get in there. They did the surgery. It sounds like he came through the surgery okay. But, Lord, I pray that you would give him full and rapid recovery, that you would be there with him. Let him know that, you know, you just uh, love him so much. We love him a lot, Lord. And so I just ask that you would give him a quick recovery. And help him to come through this okay, Lord, I pray. And I thank you for what you've already done and what you are doing in and through Socrates as well. Now, Lord, as we go, I want to just lift up everybody here and their families that, that we all have issues. And our families always bring certain things to bear that can make life difficult in certain situations. But what I pray for is that we would be a light to all those in our families and that we would not be judgmental, but loving and that we would be there for them to reflect you. Because I mean, sometimes witnessing the family can be the hardest thing to do. But Lord, let us reflect your love in the process so that they, can, they have no reason to be able then to say things like, well, you're just a hypocrite or something like that. But they would see your love shine through us and that we would be salt and light to each and every one of them. For those that have drifted away from you, Lord, and also for those who don't know you, Lord, that they would come to saving grace and that the ones who have drifted away would come back, Lord, to your saving wonder and that we would walk with you in righteousness. Oh, let me pray also for uh, Sherry, Alyssa, and Howard, Lord, as they continue to work through the COVID ID matter. Lord, help them to overcome and to, uh, to successfully come through that illness, Lord, and hopefully not to have any, any bad side effects. Keep your healing hand on them, Lord, I pray, and so that they can come back and be with us, uh, you know, in our Bible study. Now, Lord, as we go, I pray that you would just bless each and every one of us, that we would keep our eyes on you every day, that we would die to self every day and look to you, Lord, not walk according to the flesh, but in your Holy Spirit, so that we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. We thank you and we praise you for your wonder, your love, your mercy and your grace. And we just ask that you just be with us in all that we do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Ed? Yeah. Have Julie read the chat board. Okay. Julie, read the chat board. Did the you chat board? Yeah, the chat. Do you have the chat piece on Zoom? I think Victor might have sent you something. It just say read masses on chat. Yeah, exactly. Read that message on chat. Okay. Where do you see it in the when you send the video, the videos? No, no. You should see it on your phone right now. He just would have sent it to you right right now. And on my phone, there's three little dots that say more, and when I hit those more, it brings up the list of raise hand, chat, mating settings, and if it does that for you, then you hit on the chat. Oh, it's done more and i hit on chat but it doesn't say it's only say read on chat that's it and when you when you do read chat it doesn't bring anything up no okay well i'll, I'll send you her email address okay, okay. Victor. 
sending out guys. Good, good night. Good night. Okay. Thank hey, good night, Martin. God bless you. Give love to Wendy, brother. Good okay. night, Martin. Okay. Good night, Sam. Good night, Martin. Everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a good, good night, night, Sally. Good night, Sally. Good night. Sally. Good night. God bless. God bless. Take and care, everybody. And I'll, I'm sure uh, uh, Victor will get you an email. Thank you, Victor. We appreciate you. Okay. Amen. God bless. Hey, God bless. Good night. Good night, Margaret. God bless you, my sister. Good night, Ted. We'll see you on Saturday. You got it, my sister. Prophecy. More prophecies. Amen. Prophecies. <laughs> Amen to that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. God bless you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll email you her email address. Okay. Because um, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think it's, uh, hang on, hang on. It's, let me see. Hers is Julie Vela, J-U, yeah, let me just email it to you. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on, hang on. I can text it to you, right? Yeah. You got a phone number with that too, maybe? Uh, hang on, let me try. Um, Probably easier to talk on the phone. Oh, okay, okay. Hey, come back here, chat. Where are you? Oh, <laughs> there we go. I'm in the wrong place. That's why that's not working. Chat, okay. is that a guy's name? <laughs> oh, there we go. I think that's, that's chat. It. chat. Okay, there's her email address. Let me find her phone number. Hang on, hang on. Because she texts me. So I know I've got to have it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Julie and Yvonne. Uh, let's see your info. Let me see. Here. Oh, info again. Okay, here it is. Let me put that in there. Uh, Six eight three tag four one two. Okay, four zero seven six eight three four one zero. Yeah, there it is. Four zero seven six eight three four one zero one. Okay.